Thank you to, oh God, I don't sound like me. Hold on, hold on, let me start up. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who watched me make some cool ancient recipes. We've been watching all your comments and suggestions and we love it. We're gonna take a little break, brush up on our history, look for some scrolls, and then we're coming back, baby. We're coming back in the summer for some grilling and chilling, and I'll see you then on Ancient Recipes with Sola on the History YouTube channel. Hey there, I'm Sola Awaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we're gonna take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. It's a little history, it's a little cooking, and it's a whole lot of me. What's not to love? In this episode, we're gonna make a version of the original hamburger. I mean, is there any food that feels more American than the hamburger? My mind goes straight to the 50s and 60s. Americana, summer barbecues, drive-ins, roller skating. And yes, the hamburger we recognize originated in the US around the turn of the century. But a dish of meat between a couple slices of bread has been a part of many cultures throughout history. We're gonna focus on recreating one of the first versions of that sort of dish from around 200 BC ancient China, Ro GMO, which literally translates to meat in mo, which is a type of Chinese bread. So let's try it out. So the first thing we're gonna do is get our pork belly braising, because it's gonna take a little bit of time for it to get nice and tender and fall apart. We want the pork skin on there because it's gonna give us a lot of gelatin so we have a nice unctuous like braise. So the first thing I'm gonna do is crush up some rock sugar. We're gonna start this braise by caramelizing the rock sugar in a little bit of oil before we add everything else to the pot. So I'm gonna do a little smish smash. We don't need this to be a totally fine powder. We're just breaking it up so it melts a little bit more evenly for us. Okay, that feels good. And now I'm gonna heat up a little bit of oil before I add that sugar, and we're gonna cook it into a nice dark caramel. Now already, this is really different from the hamburger you or I might recognize because we're using braised pork belly instead of ground beef, but uh, it's the past. This is what they, this is how they did it. Meat and bread. Okay, rock sugar's going in. And I'm just gonna do this over like medium high heat while stirring. We want the rock sugar to melt and caramelize. In the oil, it's not gonna like totally mix, but don't freak out. It's gonna kinda look a little clumpy, but that's fine. We're just looking to develop some nice color at this point. So we're gonna season this with a bunch of spices, aromatics, but the proper Rogiamo establishments, they actually have a heritage broth that's been simmering for like 50, 60, sometimes even 70 years. They'll refresh and reseason it, but it's essentially the same pot that simmers away for over half a century. Keep this moving around so we can evenly caramelize it. Keep an eye on it because after it melts, it goes pretty quickly. And we just keep stirring. Getting, oh, that's the cutting board burning just a little bit, just slightly. There we go. It's gonna add a nice smoky aroma. Just the scent of, it's like a smoked cutting board braised pork. If you have the bone on your pork belly, I would throw that in here too. It's gonna add a lot of nice flavor to the broth. If you just got boneless, that's good too. Try and get like bone, on, bone in, skin on, whatever you got, cause that's how they would have done it before. It adds a lot of collagen, a lot of flavor. Now you can see it's kind of starting to smoke. That's how you know we're getting to the caramel stage. We're so close. It's melting, but it's still in clumps. It's not gonna fully dissolve in the oil and that's okay. This is a really um, typical way that a lot of Chinese braises are started with this like dark caramel. It adds a lot of depth. Ooh, ooh, and we're getting there. This is like amber. And I'm gonna have my water ready to deglaze cause it's gonna go pretty fast. Smoky, sizzly, and now it's time. Step back when you add the water because it's gonna splatter. Wasn't that exciting? Okay, and now all that's in there is the water, the sugar, and the oil, but because we took the time to caramelize that rock sugar, it already has a really nice color to it. And now everything just goes into the pot. I'm gonna add our pork belly. And we're gonna add a little bit of sherry here because it's what's easy to find. But traditionally, there would be a Chinese wine in here. 
You can use a modern Chinese wine like Liao Zhu, but they wouldn't have something exactly like that. But Chinese wine does date back as far as 2000 BCE. And here I've got a little bit of ginger. They might have also used galangal, which is pretty similar to ginger, but it has a little bit more floral aroma and it's not as like punchy, it's not as spicy. Now here I've got some, here I've got some Szechuan peppercorns. Szechuan peppercorns taste really unique. They're not spicy. It's more of a sensation than a flavor. Kind of has this like numbing, tingling effect and it's really nice to incorporate in dishes that are spicy because it almost like cools you down. Like a little bit of like a menthol kind of situation. We're gonna add a little bit of star anise for that, you know, licorice-y flavor. And we're gonna bump up the licorice flavor with a few slices of licorice root. Now licorice root also has a history of its own. King Tut was buried with it in his tomb in 1350 BC. And Chinese ruler Shenang thought it had magical rejuvenating powers back in 2300 BCE. Okay, add a few cloves, a little bit of cinnamon. And here I have some shanza. This is actually a berry. So it's gonna add some nice sour tart flavors, brighten the whole thing up. They're gonna kind of plump in the cooking liquid as well. And now I'm gonna add a little bit of fermented soybean paste. You could also use soy sauce. Back then they wouldn't have had soy sauce. They didn't even have soybean paste. That came a few centuries later, but they would have probably used something like fermented soybeans. All in the pot. Everybody's joining the party. We're gonna add the salt at the end because this fermented paste does have some salt. So it'll be easier for us to adjust the seasoning at the end. So getting all of it, scraping it in there. And we're gonna just let this come to a simmer and this is gonna slowly braise for about three hours. We wanna make sure it gets totally tender, completely fall apart. And in the meantime, we're gonna go make our mo bread. So this bread is pretty simple. It's gonna be all purpose flour, yeast, salt, and oil. The thing about it that's unique is the way that it's formed into these coiled buns. It's almost like laminated a little bit, but um, comes together pretty easily. I've got my all-purpose flour. And I'm gonna add some salt and yeast and whisk it up with my finger whisk, you know? This, this, the finger whisk is making a lot of appearances in this show. Now in the modern day, mo breads often have a little baking powder, baking soda, but they wouldn't have had that back then. So we're gonna give it a go OG style. None of that extra powder stuff. So I just like to start by whisking up my dry and then we're gonna pour our water and oil right into the middle and start kneading. So here we go. This is just a little bit of room temperature water, a little bit of oil, and then I'm gonna return to the finger whisk. First, just, you know, we're just kind of moistening everything, bringing it all together, and then we're gonna get in and knead. At this point, when I'm like bringing it together, I'm gonna see sometimes you need a little, add, add a little bit more water. Sometimes you need to add a little bit more flour. You just gotta, you gotta feel it as you go. The goal here is we want a really nice soft supple dough. This is called shaggy mass. You can see everything, we're getting everything wet, but it's not really come together. This is a stage you'll see in a lot of recipe writing, shaggy mass. That's what it looks like. It's shaggy. I suppose it's a mess. And I think I need a little splash of water. A little bit more. It's feeling a little dry. So I like to go just like a tablespoon at a time. Don't get too crazy because then you got to add more flour. We're just going to be going back and forth. So this dish, Ro GMO, it actually originated in Xi'an, which is one of China's oldest cities. It's famous for their terracotta army that was erected to protect this tomb of their first emperor, who died in 210 BCE, which is actually when this dish also originated. So you can, you know, hang out with the terracotta army, eat some rogia mo, a little bit more water. We want this to be nice and supple and soft. A Chinese bao buns, it's, it's a pretty similar dough, but those buns are steamed. They're also filled with meat. So it's, it's kind of like the burger situation. You got some meat in some bread, but 
it's a much newer um, dish than this one. We wanted to go back. We wanted to go back as far as we could. That's why we're making this. Okay, I think I'm feeling good about my hydration. Now we just need, and I think I'm gonna need a little height. Now I'm gonna really get in there. So it looks really rough right now, but it's gonna come together. It's gonna get nice and smooth. You just gotta keep going. Just take some time. Since we're using a white flour here instead of like a whole grain, we're gonna end up with a really fluffy and tender bread. It is really fun to see how much the dough transforms from just like kneading it. Like it was barely a dough, but as you see just from a few turns, it starts to get smoother and smoother and smoother. I kind of want to just like, can I just go on the board? Can I just go for it? Can I just power through? I need more power. I need more speed. I need the speed to need. Okay, guys, are you ready to hold this table down? So my dough, kneaded, smooth, taut. Let's return to the bowl. I'll go back to my standard height. And we're just gonna cover this and let it proof for about 40 minutes before we divide and portion. Towel, please. Thank you. All right. So we're gonna just let this rest for about 40 minutes and it's gonna be ready to roll. My bread's been poofing for about 40 minutes and it's gotten light, it's gotten fluffy, it's nice and soft. Now I'm gonna divide it into 10 portions and we're going to start forming our mo bread. So you wanna deflate just a little, that's to help distribute the gases that have developed during this first fermentation. It takes, it's gonna take a minute to proof this, so it's going to keep growing, keep poofing. I like to roll it up, really make sure, not only does this really make sure that we deflate the dough, distribute the gases, but it's gonna make it easier to portion. All right, so I find it easier to make a nice big long log, try and make it even. They wouldn't be portioning with a scale, so this is about using your eye, making it look even. We want nice, pretty, even mo buns, but also they're gonna cook evenly that way. Okay, so we'll cut this in half. <sighs> Are you half? Yes. Then we're gonna cut each portion into five. Five's a hard number to nail. Let's see, three, wait, a little bit more. We're gonna nail it. These are gonna be such consistent portions, man. We're not gonna know what's going on. Okay, so let's cut this up. If you had a scale, you could be really precise, but you know, you just wanna get close, you wanna get there. Now I'm gonna keep the rest of my dough covered while I work with one piece at a time, because we don't want it to dry out. It proofed really nicely and it's looking really good. Actually, I'm gonna do two. I can do this with two hands. Yeah, we're gonna lightly form these into balls before we make coils, so. We don't have to be crazy perfect at this point because we're not gonna make rolls. This is just to make sure that when we go on with the next stage of forming, it'll be nice and even. So just a gentle roll on the board to kind of roughly make balls. We're gonna do that with all of them. If I was making like a dinner roll and I was gonna keep it in this shape, I would keep going until it was perfectly smooth. We don't need that right now. So just quick spin on the board to get it nice and evenly balled. But uh, this is a move that I've noticed a lot of like new bakers, if you haven't used a lot of dough, it can be kind of hard. The key is don't push down too much. You're not putting, you're not squishing it. You're not, you know, if you squish it, that's gonna happen. We're just like rolling it against the, rolling against the board, you know? Like you're playing with Play-Doh, but you're doing it with the board, so you can do two, two hands at a time. If you're new to this, you can start with one hand or even two hands on one ball. And I'm kind of just, scooching it around the board with my palm, but we don't need it to be too perfect right now. So I'm gonna give it a quick circle. Okay, now the forming. Now this is, I've actually never made this dough before, so I'm really interested. It kind of comes out looking a little bit laminated, kind of like a, when you're making a scallion pancake, we're gonna get some layers in there. So we start by making this into a snake. We're gonna just keep rolling. You wanna try and keep it even, smooth. If you've got seams like that, just give them a pinch and then they'll roll together. 
and this is gonna help us create a little pocket when we split it open, like a pita pocket. This is fun, This is, this is the dough got really nice and smooth and supple from resting. Not only does it ferment when you give it that time to hang out, but the glutens are gonna relax, so it's a little bit easier to like manipulate it and handle it and do what you need to do. So, we have our snake. Now, we're gonna roll it flat. This is a really fun dough to make. So, like, like this, we're gonna go flat. We wanna go kinda thin here because that's what's gonna give us those nice layers. But it doesn't have to be perfect because we're only in like step two of the forming. And, okay, I feel good with that. Now, we're gonna smear a little oil down the middle. This is gonna keep this little pocket happening in the middle so when we split it, it's just gonna like easily open up for us, just like a pita. Little smoosh, nothing crazy. We're gonna fold this over hot dog style. I mean, this is a really fun bread to make. Fold this over and we're gonna coil it up like a cinnamon bun, like one cinnamon bun, okay? Now, I'm just gonna gently flatten this. Now, we're gonna use a rolling pin to roll it in a way where we're gonna roll just the edges because the goal is for it to end up kind of like a bowl shape. This is a little tricky and I haven't done it before. So I'm gonna try my best. But our goal is for this to ultimately be just under one centimeter thick. So we're gonna use the end, end of the rolling pin and turn as I roll and hopefully we end up with a kind of a cup shape. I don't know, honestly. It's my first time doing this thing so we're figuring out together. But uh, I think something passable might be happening. This process is called lamination, which sounds super fancy and scary, but all it means is you're just layering the dough with some fat, and that's how you get something flaky and tender. And that can be as simple as something like this or something as complex and difficult as like a croissant. It's just about layering, but I feel like we're getting our bowl shape, huh? We're kind of in shallow bowl territory. All right, that looks cool just a little bit thinner and we have one mo i believe we have one mo guys we did it okay this side's a little bit thicker than this so i'm just gonna try and even it out a little bit even if you can't get the bowl shape the most important thing is that it's an even thickness so it cooks evenly it's gonna cook pretty quickly kind of in the same way as you cook an english muffin we're gonna griddle it and then it's gonna go in the oven so both sides are gonna get direct heat on a hot cast iron pan. All right, there's one mo. Let's make mo mo. Mo mo? More mo? I'll stop. Now we're gonna bake our mo bread. They would traditionally bake this bread in a clay oven, which gets really, really hot. So to try and mimic that heat, we're gonna use a preheated cast iron skillet. So this guy, has been in here getting nice and hot, but we need even more heat. So we're actually gonna turn the burner on and give it a quick griddle on both sides over some intense heat. We wanna develop a little bit of color. This is gonna help it, poof, give us a little immediate lift. So I'm popping these on here. It's a lot like cooking a English muffin, but because this dough is a little bit more dense than an, than an English muffin, we have to finish it in the oven. It needs a little bit more heat to cook through. We're gonna just do this for 30 seconds on here until we get a nice light golden brown color. Flip, repeat, and then we're going back in our hot oven. This is a good way to mimic that like raging hot heat. Clay ovens get super, super, super hot, like 100, like 800, 900 degrees, a lot like a pizza oven. Uh, your oven at home is never gonna get more than 500, so giving it a start on cast iron is gonna help us out a lot. Cast iron does a really good job at retaining heat. And look at that, we already have some nice golden brown color. So I'm gonna flip these over, let them go for about 30 seconds on the other side. And then we're gonna go right into that hot oven. I can already feel the side that was on the cast iron is feeling dry, crisp, and a little, a little bit of fluff. And then once we split these open, it's, it should be nice and fluffy on the inside. And because we put that little smudge of oil in the middle before folding it and coiling it up. We should, if everything goes right, it should kind of have a little bit of a pocket. 
situation when we split it open and fill it up with meat. Oh, oh, we have nice golden brown color on both sides. I'm gonna pop this in the oven now to finish cooking. This goes really quick. So, here we go. And we wait. Two minutes. Just enough time, you know, to do nothing. I think our mode bread is done now, so I'm gonna take a look. Oh yes, we have a cheap puff. And another way to tell is when I pick it up, it kind of sounds a little bit hollow. So we know that it's nice and dry, cooked through. It's not gonna be dense or gummy on the inside. And we're just gonna let this cool slightly and then we can fill it with our pork. So let's, uh, let's put this thing together. Okay, so our pork is nice, wiggly, tender. We've got our meat, we've got our mo, and now we're gonna make our rogia mo. Let's build it. So let me pull this pork belly out. The liquid has really nicely reduced and it smells very good. I mean, this smelled pretty good immediately after putting those spices in there. Now, when I'm shredding meat, I like to go for like big meaty bites. There's a lot of nice color. Even though we didn't give it a sear, that caramelized sugar cooked down and kind of like coated everything really nicely. So we got some good color there. I imagine this is going to have a really nice deep flavor from that long cook. I'm pretty impressed by how much color developed just over time on this pork belly. Because when we put it in there, we just dropped it in there. No sear, none of that, but it really darkened. And, and that's what happens with a braise. You can get some really nice color and develop a lot of good flavor. Okay, let me break this up a little bit more and then we'll build one. Now, I don't want to let any of this braising liquid just go to waste, so I'm gonna sauce it up just a touch. A little bit of moisture. Oh, yeah. Now, the, the modern rogia mo, the street vendors at this point would add the chopped peppers and cilantro, but the classic version, the ancient version, it would just be this meat inside of the bread. That's good. I like like nice big hunks. Now let's check out our mo. Oh yeah, these are so cute. They came out really nice and fluffy, swirly. Hold on, I want, I want the prettiest one. I like this one. They're all cute in their own way. But if you see it got a little bit fluff after it baked, it kind of feels like a fancy swirly English muffin. I'm gonna go ahead and slice this. Let's see if we got that pocket. This feels really nice and fluffy and tender. It smells good. It smells like yeasty and fermented. Now let's just pile up the meat. Get in there, okay. I'm gonna be like kind of generous, right? Let's, let's get crazy. That looks good already. I'm excited. It doesn't look like the hamburger I know, but I don't mind. I think I'm gonna do even more braising liquid because that fluffy bun can like sop it up. A little bit here, a little bit here. Why the hell not? Who needs mayo when you have fatty, porky braising liquid, right? Okay, so we got our rouge à mot. We got our mo. We got our meat. Here we go. Should we get in there? Let's do it. This looks really juicy and moist, and I think this is gonna be a messy bite, but let's, let's get, go for it. Hmm. <laughs> is this for my face? Okay. So it's a lot of it's what I expected. The bun is super fluffy and tender. The meat is really like succulent and fatty, but the flavor combo is like a new thing for me. I'm not familiar with a lot of these flavors, the star anise, the licorice, the shanza berries, but when you bring it all together, it's like really floral and aromatic. Even though it's like got that long cooked braised thing happening, there's this brightness from the florality of all of the aromatics we put in there. It's kind of surprising to me. I really do like the hint of sweetness. Whenever you have something really fatty like pork, a little bit of sweetness 
kind of really like, it really works. It really works together with the unctuous, unctuousness of the pork. It wasn't a whole lot of rock sugar in the beginning, but it really made a difference. Um, this tastes nothing, nothing like a hamburger. It doesn't feel like a hamburger, you know? I'm used to the, you know, American cheese, onion, lettuce, but it, it feels like a hamburger. You know what I mean? We got the meat between the bread. It has like this satisfying vibe. I feel like this would be something that I would want to eat like in the middle of the day. When you're busy working, it would be filling, give you everything you need. I would definitely make this again. I especially really like this bread. It's pretty cool how these really basic ingredients, and it's a really standard bread dough that you probably have the stuff to make now, but just by forming it a little bit differently, using a different technique, you get this totally new texture. It does, like, when you bite into it, these coils do kind of pull apart, so it has this, like, almost flakiness. This bread is really fun, and I hope you give it a shot. And I am very surprised by this, like, combo of spices. I definitely would make this again, but I know that this isn't exactly the hamburger we all know and love. So if there's another original hamburger out there that you want us to try out, let us know in the comments. And if you liked this episode, be sure to subscribe. And as always, hit us up in the comments if there's a vintage or ancient recipe you want to see me try out. And I'll see you next time.